So, it's been a while. I figured with the release of Pokemon Violet, it was probably about time I got back into uploading on this channel. Before you ask, what if Ash woke up on time is coming, but for now, let's just do a nice dumb challenge. You may or may not remember me playing through Pokemon Sword with the six worst bug type Pokemon in the game. Well, today I thought we could take it a step further. Can you beat Pokemon Violet using the six worst Pokemon in the game? Generation 9 has introduced a wealth of new Pokemon drawing on dolphins, dung beetles, dead dogs, and tapeworms, among various other things. Unfortunately, they're all a little bit too good. Paldean Wooper, Tarantula, and Nimble represent the worst the Paldea region has to offer, with each of their base stat totals sitting at 210. The best Pokemon we'll be using is tied with Magikarp and Feebas at 200. Anyway, you're probably all itching to meet the new team. Hopefully that's an idiomatic itch and doesn't involve Wiglet. Either way, let's get into it. As always, we'll be using no items in battle and playing on a set battle style, even if the game has removed that option from settings. Basically, we'll never switch when prompted. Our journey begins in the small town of Cabo Poco with a purple bowl cut and a dream. Director Clavel insists we take a starter Pokemon from him, but with Quaxly, Sprigatito, and Fuecoco all possessing base stat totals north of 300, they are not on my radar. We select Fuecoco to give ourselves more of a chance in some battles down the road, and then head towards Los Platos with our neighbor, Nimona. She wants us to catch a Lechonk on Poco Path, but again, it's much too good for us. We're forced to use Fuecoco in battle, but after this, we're ready to begin the challenge. There is a single Pokemon on Poco Path whose base stat total is low enough for us to use. At 200, the team's star player will be Scatterbug. As Magikarp is also in the game and matches that exactly, we had to make a choice. Since Scatterbug can be acquired ever so slightly earlier, I decided to make the bug our ace. It also offers a whole lot more, so let's be thankful there aren't any Magikarp around here. The first Scatterbug we catch has Shield Dust for its ability and a fairly useless nature, so we gather a few more. I'll only be using one of each of the worst six Pokémon, but I'm willing to catch a few to get something halfway usable. After just a couple of write-offs, we pick up Alfombra, who's got Compound Eyes and an Adamant Nature, which is exactly what we were looking for. So, everyone say goodbye to Slink and Skaboo. Their sacrifice will be remembered. Now that we've got a legal Pokémon, we can get the game underway properly. Like any good game, that starts with us falling off a cliff and shattering both legs before our phone lifts us up a bit and lowers us gently to the ground. I don't want to criticize Rotom too harshly there, but its actions sort of feel like pulling the parachute for the visceral remains of somebody who's just plummeted to Earth. Unlike that somebody, its heart may have been in the right place, but it's probably done more harm than good. I haven't done one of these in a while, I'm getting very off topic. We meet Maridon, who eats our sandwich, and then adds some broken ribs to our growing list of medical issues. Given the choice, I probably would have taken my chances with the level 3 Hound Hour. Back above ground, we meet Arvin, who berates Maridon before challenging us to a battle. This is more familiar territory. Arvin's only got a squavet, and thanks to Compound Eye, Stun Spore's accuracy is 97.5%, so we start things off by paralyzing it. We still look set to lose the battle, but it may be impossible as Arvin calls for three consecutive tail whips when Alfombra's one hit from death. I'm not sure it bodes well that Arvin has to be deliberately incompetent for three turns to hand us the win in a battle where we were higher level than his single Squavit. That's the best Pokemon we'll be using too. This should go swimmingly. After completing that battle, the game opens up a bit and we can go about putting together the rest of this super team. In a nearby pond, we come across Azuril, who qualifies for the team with a base stat total of 190. On our second attempt, we catch Spacehopper, who has the ability Huge Power, which will definitely come in handy. Realistically, that ability makes Azuril much better than the stats suggest, but it still isn't exactly great. Closer to Los Platos, we encounter a Sunkern, who holds the distinction of being the worst Pokémon in existence, with a base stat total of just 180. Technically, Wishy Washy's 175 is lower, but it spends most of its time in a different form, which raises that up to a slightly better 620. So, I think Sunkern's a little bit worse. Its Pokedex entry does very little to bolster my confidence. It is very weak. Its only means of defense is to shake its leaves desperately at its attacker. Welcome to the Team Leaf! The last Pokémon we can pick up around Los Platos is Ralts. Sitting at 198, this is the second best Pokémon we'll be using, which does seem worrying. In the worst bug Pokémon in Sword video, we had an Inkata whose base stat total was 266. Ralts is averaging 33 per stat and is our second best Pokémon. Again, not ideal. 
We nickname her Bowl Cut, and with that, I think it's time to branch out. The game really wants you to head to Mesa Goza at this point to start your schooling at the Uva Academy, but with the help of some nifty teleportation, we can get out into the open world and pick up our last two team members. Was this necessary? No, not even slightly. Did I just want to see how far I could go? Yeah, pretty much. It takes half an hour without the use of Maridon, but once we reach Cortando, we can grab ourselves a Cricketon. With a base stat total of 194, the Cricket Pokémon is simultaneously our third best Pokémon, and the fifth worst Pokémon in existence, not counting Wishiwashi. If you're wondering just how far we walked, that single journey was enough to trigger Space Hopper's high friendship evolution after just one battle. Cue the first of many, many, many mashings of B. That short journey to reach Cricketot felt like nothing compared to our next piece of travel, though. In search of our final team member, we head west out of Cortando across the West Province until we reach Cascarafa. Then we cross the Asado Desert to Porto Maranada, and from there head east through Medali and the Dali Zappa Passage to Zappa Pico. Just outside of town, we come across Snom, who's the final piece of the puzzle. At 185, Snom's base stat total is... better than Sunkern's. So, that's something. Unfortunately, at level 36, there's no chance that Snom will obey us without any badges, so we've got to catch a female Snom too. That way we can breed a Snom who will trust us once we can access picnics. Now that we've got our full team and explored practically the entire Paldea region, it's probably time to make our way to school. One of the advantages of our extensive travel is that we've picked up a plethora of TM moves to teach our team. Leaf having access to Solar Beam and Bullcut knowing Psybeam and Thunderbolt before the battle with Nimona does feel potentially helpful. We lead off with Xyla the Cricketot against Nimona Sprigatito, and the type advantage quickly puts us into the lead. When she sends out Paw Me, we switch things up and call on Leaf. After soaking up some damage from Thundershock while setting up Sunny Day, Sunkern absorbs light and unleashes a Solar Beam to one-shot Paw Me and hand us an easy win. Sadly, Leaf is a little bit too short and we miss his celebratory dance. There's just one more obstacle between us and the school, and that's Team Star. In the process of our two battles against the Grunts, Nimona gives us a Terra Orb. Bullcut becomes the first member of the team to terrestrialize en route to victory, and with that we can finally get into the main game. Having visited the Uva Academy, our treasure hunt has begun, so we can now begin taking on Paldea's gym leaders, Titan Pokémon, and Team Star bases. Before going to any of those, though, we need a Snom who'll actually listen to us, so it's time for a picnic. Although Snowcone and Piragua don't go near each other and spend most of their time sleeping, it's enough to create an egg somehow. From that egg, we hatch Granita, who's got an up special attack nature, which is actually what I wanted, so we'll take it. Alright, we're properly getting started now. The open world nature of the game means we can really start wherever we want, but the conventional beginning works best for us. The Cortando gym leader Katie specializes in bug type Pokemon, and Space Hopper knows how to bounce, obviously. Nimble, Tarantula, and the Terra Teddy Ursa are all captivated by Azuril's mad hops, and after surviving a Fury Cutter on 3 HP, she seems destined to sweep. The 85% accurate bounce misses the finishing blow, though, so Katie's ace takes her down. After Scatterbug sacrifices herself to stun Teddy Ursa, we send out Bullcut to finish the battle with a Thunderbolt. Not exactly the smoothest victory, but it wasn't a disaster. From there, we continue on the Gym Challenge path and visit Artisan to gather an army of Sunflora. I just love my laggy floral children. As the second gym in Paldea focuses on grass-type Pokémon, our strategy won't change at all. While I'm on the subject, bug and grass should never really be near each other in terms of gym typings. I like switching up my team a lot in general gameplay, and strategies for bug and grass gyms tend to be identical. As you can see, Space Hopper's bounce is enough to wipe out Petalil and Smoliv before Brassius's ace, Truly Wudo, is revealed. I'm fairly sure that terrestrialization was only created so they could make that pun. The team's weaknesses become abundantly clear as Space Hopper, Alfombra, Bullcut, Xyla, and Granita are all obliterated by the Terrasud Udo, leaving only Leaf. My hopes aren't exactly high up against a grass type, but Sunkern dodges a rock throw before connecting with Mega Drain to get some damage off. Then he dodges a second. The Pokédex insisted that all Sunkern could do was shake his leaves, but his dodging ability is clearly unparalleled. Another hit drains a little more health from Brassius' ace before Leaf rolls away to avoid a third consecutive rock throw. That's literally a 1 in a thousand chance, so Leaf has already proven his worth as far as I'm concerned. One final Mega Drain knocks off Sudowoodo, and this time we actually get to see Sunkern's celebration. Well, well deserved. 
On a high from that incredible victory, we make our way to the first team starbase, figuring that our overwhelming number of bugs should do well against the dark type Pokemon there. The grunt guarding the gates of the base ends up sweeping our entire team with her Murkrow though. That'll put you in your place pretty quickly. The team grinds up some levels, and despite gaining revenge on Murkrow and easing through the Team Star base, everything falls apart against the base's leader Giacomo. Without any trouble, his Ponyard dispatches our entire team. So much for having an advantage against Dark types. Let's try something else. The first Titan Pokémon, or at least the lowest leveled one, is Cloth, a pure rock type. Even though it has an advantage against most of our Pokémon, we do have Leaf the Sunker, and whose Solar Beam gives us access to the second phase of the battle. Despite Cloth powering up with an Urban Mystica, thanks to some help from Arvin and Shelder, Leaf hands us another win. Okay, back on track. Following that win, I did another quick lap of Paldea in search of useful TMs to help the team and ended up picking up Bug Buzz for Snom and Earth Power for Sunker. In our travels, the whole team made it up to level 23, with a few higher than that, so we return to challenge Giacomo once more. Alfombra and Leaf fall to Ponyard before Bug Buzz makes its first appearance to finally earn us a knockout against the first Team Star boss. Then we have to fight a truck. If you haven't played Scarlet and Violet yet, I won't be giving you any more context than that. We really have to do this by committee. Snom, Cricketot, and Azuril all make a mark on the Seagan Starmobile, but are run down by the truck before Ralts finally finishes it off with a Draining Kiss. We were literally one hit from death there, even with our overwhelming level advantage, which should tell you just how tough this is going to be. It may be an oversimplification, but in Paldea, for the most part, the Titan Pokémon are the easiest challenge, followed by the gyms, followed by the Team Star bases. In other words, I'm glad you can challenge the different elements in any order you choose, because the next Team Star base is fire, and our team isn't terribly ready for that. Before even thinking about attempting that, we've got a fairly simple Titan Pokémon in our way. Similar to the battle with Cloth, Bombardier only requires the use of one Pokémon. Bullcut electrifies the open sky Titan with a few Thunderbolts handing us another easy win alongside Arvin. Before we can continue on with the Paldean Gym Challenge, Nimona insists on battling us in Lavincia. Leaf the Sunkern makes quick work of a Rock Ruff and Palmy using Giga Drain and Earth Power, leaving only Florigato. It's worth noting that Sunkern has absolutely proven his worth so far. Endeavor even puts in some work to weaken the Terrestrialized Grass Starter. Essentially, there's not much work left to do for Granita, who enters the battle and finishes it just as quickly with a Bug Buzz. Once that's out of the way, we can take on the gym. I'll just give you a quick overview of the important moments from our first face-off with Iono, because, spoiler alert, we didn't win. First and foremost, Snom's little terrestrial hat is the most adorable thing. Ever. In anything. Just look how tiny it is. Secondly, and lastly, Slam is one of the worst moves in the history of Pokémon. I'm reasonably confident that nobody has ever made contact with it. They could make it 500 base power, and there'd still be no reason to use it. After getting every member of our team up into the 30s, we return to take on Iono again, and it goes much better. At the battle's climax, it comes down to Miss Magius and Azuril. As we've only got the not very effective bounce and the stab slam as physical options, it's once again up to slam. First try, miss. Second try, self-inflicted confusion damage. With Space Hopper weak and Miss Magius' special attack rising, the third attempt will be the final one. Thankfully, Slam connects for the first time ever to give us the win and earn us our third Paldean Gym Badge. Having overleveled to take on Iono, the lurking Steel Titan, Urthworm, is a fairly simple prospect. No, I cannot say it any other way. Thunderbolt gives us another Titan victory, so let's move on. As the next Team Star boss uses fire types, we're gonna attempt the fourth gym before taking her on. The Kaskarafa gym leader Kofu has two sets of eyebrows, which I do not understand, but his three Pokémon I do get. We start off with Granita taking on Veluza and survive a pluck with one HP. Not because Snom likes me or thanks to an item, just by sheer coincidence. Bug Buzz deals some significant damage before another pluck takes out Granita. It hits Xylahar too before her Bug Bite evens things up. Wugtrio goes through Krikatot and Scatterbug before Bullcut's Thunderbolt takes Kofu down to one. After terrestrializing, Crabominable knocks out Ralts and Azuril, leaving just Sunker. Leaf, rather infuriatingly, gets hit twice by Slam, which seems like it should be illegal. Giga Drain is constantly restoring its HP, though, so it's only a matter of time before we get more leaf shaking celebrations. Oh, god, we've got to try Mela now, don't we?
Alright, let's try something else then. This is where the open world nature of the game can be really appreciated. At level 34 across the board, we head for the Quaking Earth Titan despite being really underleveled. The first phase of the battle goes exceptionally well, with Sunkern surviving a powerful hit from Iron Treads before using Endeavor to take us onto the second phase. Leaf is then wiped out quickly, but Bullcut's Hypnosis puts us in complete control. Arvin's Sko Villain does most of the damage, but Rot steals the killing blow with Psychic, so I'm taking all of the credit. At this point, we get our usual post-battle B-Mash to stop all evolutions, which includes the quite jarring revelation that there's more than one bowl cut. Well, more than two bowl cuts if you include mine, I guess. Riding high after our victory over Iron Treads, and knowing Mela and Larry are both a bit beyond us, we visit Castle Royal Lake to take on the False Dragon Titan. This is way too early to do this, but it actually goes surprisingly well. Unlike the previous Titan battles, this one has a third phase, adding an extra level of difficulty. We make it to that final phase without too many issues. When Arvin KOs his own Greedon with takedown against Tatsugiri though, there's no longer anyone to take hits for us. Bolkut manages to take the Sleeping Dragon below half health, but once Tatsugiri wakes up, it one-shots our entire team. That is slightly problematic, because it means we're not really ready for any of the battles in front of us. Huh. Thankfully, we're now just about strong enough to start battling the Chanseys in the north of Paldea. Any halfway decent physical attacker, you can just make a ham sandwich and go destroy some Chansey. In one 30 minute session, Spacehopper gets up to level 50 and the rest of the team reach 43 or 44. With that, we should be ready to take on Dondozo and Tatsugiri. Alfombra starts the battle underwater without her little blow up raft, which could be a cause for concern, but after a pounce she begins levitating a foot above the lake. Probably more of a cause for concern. All credit to Alfombra, she almost takes down Dondozo solo, but is ultimately defeated, leaving it up to Bullcut to earn the win. When Tatsugiri emerges, we attempt to paralyze it with Scatterbug Stun Spore, but Dragon Pulse puts pay to that. So, to slow it down, we turn to Granita and Icy Wind. While Tatsugiri's focus remains on Arvin's Greedent, Snom connects five times, almost bottoming out the miniature Water Dragon's speed. We then send in Xyla to lower its special attack with Struggle Bug, but as Greedent's down, we're the sole focus of attacks now. Still, Xyla succeeds in halving Tatsugiri's special attack stat before falling to Muddy Water. With all of that set up, Bullcut's able to enter the battle, Terastalize, and finish off Tatsugiri with Psychic. I think that makes it four straight Titan victories for Ralts. Nice. Beyond just avoiding Mela and Larry, part of what made me want to take on Tatsugiri was the thought of unlocking Maridon's rock climbing ability. That allows us to scale the cliffs in the Asado Desert and grab the TM for Body Slam, which means no more regular bodiless slam, which is fantastic. That should lower my stress levels a bit. By this point, we've practically doubled Mela's levels in our quest to beat the final Titan Pokemon. With the help of Rain Dance, Azuril washes away Torkoal before crushing Mela's truck with a Body Slam. Yeah, Space Hopper only weighs 2 kilos, but she can generate a whole lot of power in her Body Slams. We jump straight from the Mela victory into challenging the Medali Gym Leader Larry, but that's a bridge too far at our current levels. We make it through to his ace, but with only Azura left standing, we don't have a chance. Facade quickly ends our first run at Larry in failure. One Chansey session later, the whole team is up to level 49, with Space Hopper all the way up at 57. That advantage will hopefully give us enough to get past Larry. Azura starts things off by destroying Kamala with Body Slam. Yawn kicks in before she can take down to Dunsparce though, so that job falls to Leaf. Giga Drain finishes the job, leaving us in a 5 on 1 against Staraptor. Only 4 of them are weak to flying too, so we're in good shape. Sunkern gets instantly obliterated by a crit aerial ace, so we send out Bullcut, whose ability may just save us. Trace copies Staraptor's Intimidate, lowering its attack. After that, we shift into Xyla, who gets off a growl before fainting. Another bit of Intimidation and some Icy Winds further weaken Staraptor before we call on Alfombra. In the end, we don't even need Bullcut to finish things. Scatterbug ends up being the unlikely hero, surviving on 1 HP before knocking off Staraptor with Pounce. I'd like to think that's the first time most of you will have seen a Scatterbug knocking out a Staraptor. That takes our tally to 12 badges in total, having completed 5 gyms, beaten all 5 Titans, and conquered 2 Team Star bases. There's a post-gym face-off with Nimona next, but it ends in heartbreaking circumstances. Down to a one-on-one, -on -one, Space Hopper's bounce connects, leaving Nimona's Meowskarada on Death's door, but having lived the hit, he counters with Flower Trick to hand her the last gasp win. Thankfully, this isn't a battle that we need to win, so we're allowed to move on despite our very painful loss. 
We do have one more battle that we probably could have done earlier after our first run-in with the Chanseys. Team Star's third boss, Atticus, has a team in the low 30s, so we're about 20 levels over at this point. As a result of that, Bullcut's almost able to sweep his entire poison team with Draining Kiss and Psychic. The Navi Starmobile just about prevents the sweep with Noxious Torque, though. That may or may not be a spoiler for that new Avatar movie. I can't confidently say that it's not. The climax sees Leaf taking down the Navi with Earth Power. That one's probably a spoiler. With the next gym featuring a ghost type double battle, we decide to head to Alfrenada's psychic gym instead. As it turns out, taking on Tulip wasn't a great plan. Things actually get off to the perfect start thanks to a timely quick claw pop for Granita. It allows Snom to connect with a double dose of Bug Buzz while Farigarath can only set up Reflect. So, without taking any damage, we have an early lead. Gardevoir then one-shots Snom and Ralts before they can make a mark, but a quite fantastic performance from Azuril takes Tulip down to two. Ispathra stops us in our tracks, though, finishing off Space Hopper before making light work of Xyla, Alfombra, and Leaf. That wasn't particularly close, especially considering our lucky start. We level up courtesy of some Chansey and then return to challenge Tulip once more. Just to show how lucky we got last time, in spite of our leveling up, the battle's opening is flipped this time around. Verigraph gets the better of Granita with Zen Headbutt, forcing Xyla to come in with Bug Bite to help out. The tide turns against Gardevoir, though. Cricketot falls to Psychic, but not before dealing some damage with Bug Bite. Then Leaf toughs it out at 1 HP so I won't feel sad, and finishes off Gardevoir with Giga Drain. That mechanic is certainly a controversial one, and as a warning, you'll be seeing more and more of that as we go forward. Espathra eliminates Leaf once again, but this time around we terrestrialize Alfombra after connecting with Stun Spore and go for a Terra Blast, which... Espathra survives. God damn it. Thanks to the paralysis, Bullcut is able to knock out the Big Bird without taking a hit, but we're down to two for Tulip's Ace. She calls on Florigis and terrestrializes immediately as we call for Thunderbolt. Moonblast connects first and almost knocks off Ralts before a fairly weak counter barely leaves a mark. Without any real hope of survival, we call for Hypnosis. Moonblast finds its target once more, and Bullcut holds firm on 1 HP. Then, to complete the perfect turn, actually succeeds in putting Florges to sleep. In the end, the sleep doesn't last long, but it does allow us to connect with the second Thunderbolt. Space Hopper enters the battle for the final one-on-one, -on -one, now at a frankly ridiculous level 71. Moonblast can't even take her below half health before Body Slam ends the battle, earning us our sixth gym badge. That 26 level advantage really did come in handy. Before we can take on Rhyme in the Montanavera gym, Nimona returns to challenge us for a fourth time. We've seen enough of her for now though, there'll be more of her later too. As we've taught Space Hopper Terra Blast at this point, we actually have a fairly decent solution for Meowskarada. Azuril's Terra type is fairy, so not only is it pretty powerful, it's also super effective. Or, I guess it would be if she didn't terrestrialize, which she always does, so scrap that. Anyway, enough of Nimona for now, let's move on to the greatest rapper of her generation, the MC of R.I.P. Rhyme. As I suspect it's what Rhyme would have wanted, the next, hmm, what, 30-40 seconds are going to be terrible. Just prepare for that. The battle begins with a double shadow sneak KO. Giga Drain then breaks the skies to interrupt her flow. A couple more turns and Leaf defeats Mimikyu. Stun Spore to Bayonet, Houndstone comes on through. Phantom Force to Sunkern is too much to handle. Call on DJG Rave to light up her candle. Pour one out in the snow for the realist seed. Bayonet 2 with Snom Vengeance is guaranteed. Rhyme calls on her race, unleashes its terrestrial form. Granita's right behind for regression to the norm. Ghost type disappears with a single Terra Blast. Houndstone reappears. Rhyme's Blast is aghast. Insult to injury with the double quick claw pop, Terra Blast connects again and Houndstone drops. Rhyme's reign of terror ends in defeat so sheer. This one goes out to my guy, Pro Cashier. I can only apologize for that. Rhyme offered a brief respite from the repetitive grinding, but Paldea's final gym leader sends us right back to it. Having tasted defeat at the hands of yet another gym leader, we return to the North Province to taste a perfectly crafted ham sandwich instead. One session later, the entire team are up to at least level 66, so we head back to Glaciado to take on Grusha. Keen to prove Snom's superiority to Frozmoth, Granita scores the battle's first KO with Bug Buzz before even taking damage. Snom has truly mastered the Quick Claw. 
Grenada almost makes it two for two against Grusha's Titan, coming up just short, but Bull cuts on hand to finish the job. When Bertic joins the fray, Ralphs uses Hypnosis to send the bear into early hibernation. Sadly, Psychic fails to knock out Bertic while succeeding in waking up our sleeping foe. Bullcut and Xyla both fall to Beretic before Spacehopper takes Grusha down to one. When Altaria comes in and terastalizes, we switch things up, allowing Leaf to sacrifice himself so Alvombra can hit with Stun Spore. Scatterbug actually achieves much more than that, almost winning the battle on her own before a hurricane finally blows her away. Regardless, Scatterbug's hard work has left a very simple task for Spacehopper, whose Terror Blast earns us our eighth and final Paldean Gym Badge. That means we are free to visit the Pokemon League now, but we have some unfinished business with Team Star first. We don't need to spend too much time on Ortega. Team Star's Fairy Specialist isn't a massive challenge after we've overleveled for Grusha, so we can skip through most of it. The battle reaches its conclusion with Ralts fighting a truck, you know, classic Pokemon stuff. While Terastalize, Bullcut Psychic is boosted high enough to knock off the Rookba Starmobile in only three hits. That just leaves Eerie. The boss of Team Star's fighting crew is exceptionally tough. You could definitely make the argument that she's the toughest trainer in Paldea. Our first attempt ends in embarrassment as we can't even take down two of her five Pokemon. You know what that means. It's Hamsan Chan time. By the end of this grinding session, our levels range from 72 to 82, which gives us a pretty significant advantage. We get things started with Alfombra paralyzing Toxicroak before switching into Xyla for, well, a sacrifice. That's honestly been Cricketot's main purpose in this run. If we need a free switch into one of our Pokemon, we let Xyla soak up some hits and faint to allow a free entry. Bullcut follows Xyla into battle and knocks off Toxicroak with Psychic. When Eerie sends out her Annihilate, we switch into Space Hopper anticipating a Rage Fist. That comes to pass, so Zeril can blow the Angry Ape away with a Terra Blast. Basimian's next on the chopping block and makes its mark with close combat before being similarly obliterated by Terra Blast. Eerie's Lucario then knocks out Leaf and Alfombra before yet another Terra Blast earns Space Hopper a knockout. The Kef Starmobile comes ever so close to making it four straight KOs for Terra Blast, but Azuril comes up just short. There was every chance that we could have still lost this battle from here, but Bullcut isn't really into that. Rave of Room's spin out crashes through Ralts, but she lives on one HP to keep us happy. Psychic completes the job, winning us the battle, earning us our 18th total badge. There's still a surprisingly long way to go though. Through our entire rivalry with Team Star, we've been taking commands from Cassiopeia, a mysterious voice on the end of the phone. Now we're tasked with taking them down back at the Uva Academy. When we return to the school though, it's Director Clavel who greets us, revealing himself to be Cassiopeia. Okay, I guess we're doing this. Grenita starts the battle across from Clavel's Aranguru and gets us off to a fast start with Bug Buzz giving us the lead. Following the traditional sacrifice from Xyla, Spacehopper enters the battle and destroys Houndoom and Abomasnow with Terror Blasts. Poltegeist only manages to save itself by burning Azuril before the Terror Blast connects. Grenita returns to battle to score another knockout, this time by using Icy Wind. Clavel calls on Amoongus next, but Icy Wind blows him away too. That's three separate wins for Snom in this one battle. Heroic stuff. Clavel's terastalized Quaquaval finally puts an end to Grenita, but what a run it was. Alfombra is out next for the familiar Stun Spore and Pounce combo that's essentially just there to make things easier for whoever comes next. As Scatterbug readies to pounce though, the ghost of a girl who haunts the school passes over the battlefield, almost doing enough to distract her. Once Alfombra is ultimately defeated, Bolcut comes in to put down Quaquaval with a Thunderbolt. Having lost the battle, Clavel shockingly reveals that he was lying about being Cassiopeia, so let's go battle the real thing. When we reach the schoolyard, it's revealed that Penny has been Cassiopeia all along. Now, I don't think I've mentioned Penny at all yet, so if you're experiencing this game for the first time through this video, that's going to be quite a confusing reveal. The big boss of Team Star uses a full team of evolutions, which is amazing, but I can't help but feel bad for Espeon and Glaceon. The start of the battle sees Granita taking down Umbreon before Flareon gets some revenge. Bullcut traces Flareon's flash fire on entry, making things slightly awkward for Penny. While Flareon's confused about what to do, we set up Trick Room, Terastalize Ralts, and knock out the Fire-type with Psychic. The same fate befalls Leafeon and Vaporeon before the Twisted Dimensions return to normal and Jolteon KOs Ralts with Quick Attack. Leaf comes out next and tanks a Crit Thunder to best Jolteon with Earth Power, taking Penny down to 1. Sylveon enters the battle in a 1 on 4 and quickly knocks out Leaf, but from there it's just a slow dismantling. Scatterbug and Cricketot leave Sylveon paralyzed with her speed down and her special attack bottomed out. There are no doubts remaining when we send out Spacehopper. 
One Body Slam finishes off Sylveon and Penny, drawing the Team Star storyline to a close. Next up, Pokemon League. Our levels range from 83 to 92 as we ready ourselves for the challenge ahead. That may seem over the top, but it's actually pretty necessary. Before taking on the Elite Four, we have to prove to Rika that we're not a robot by sitting on a chair like a normal human being. Yeah, that looks about right. For that incredible performance, Rika decides that we're ready to take on the Elite Four, starting with her. The ground type specialist leads off with Whiskash, who connects with Blizzard just failing to take out Sunkern. Leaf counters with Giga Drain, one-shotting Palafin's dopey cousin and regaining a good chunk of HP. When Camerupt enters, we switch out to Scatterbug, who's instantly incinerated by Fire Blast. Bull cuts next in line, and after being hit by a contagious yawn, sets up Trick Room for the next five turns. That's all we wanted from Ralph, so we go out to Azuril next, who eats back-to-back -back Fire Blasts. Great idea with Trick Room. Then attacks with a not very effective blast of her own. Yes, okay, I forgot that Fire Resisted Fairy. As always. It's still a one-shot, so it doesn't even matter. When Rika calls on Donvan, the Trick Room actually helps us, allowing Space Hopper to land the first blow. Sturdy prevents the one-hit KO, though, and Iron Head is too much for Azuril to take. Leaf returns to battle next, and Trick Room screws us again. Sunkern manages to survive a powerful Poison Jab to pick up another win with Giga Drain, but all in all, this is going terribly. The Twisted Dimensions return to normal just in time for Doug Trio to enter. Wow, timing could not have been better in this one. An Earthquake drains the remainder of Leaf's HP before Granita comes in clutch with another timely quick claw pop. Icy Wind blows away Doug Trio, leaving Rika with only one. Claude Sire is her ace, and honestly, that's fine by us. Even though it takes three turns, Icy Wind gets the job done while EQ and Toxic barely phase Granita. One down, three to go. Poppy is up next, and her Steel-type specialty is a little bit of a problem for us. We only have one move that's super effective against Steel-type Pokémon, and that's Leaf's non-stab Earth power. Steel also resists Bug, Normal, Psychic, Grass, Ice, and Fairy. That's almost every attacking move we have right there. We also don't have a single Pokémon who resists Steel-type moves, but we do have two who are weak to them. Essentially, Steel is not the best matchup for us. The battle begins with Leaf the Sunker and facing off against Poppy's Copperaja. All credit to Leaf, one Earth Power almost gives us the perfect start. Really unfortunately for us, Poppy doesn't call for an attack, choosing to set up Stealth Rock instead. That's good, only three of our Pokémon are weak to Rock, including one Quad Weakness, so shouldn't be a problem. Corviknight follows Copperaja, and remember all of those issues I talked about with Steel? Yeah, flying isn't great for us either. Earth Power is probably not so much help anymore. There's only one way through this for us, so we switch Leaf for Xyla when the Winged Steel monstrosity hits the field. Brave Bird? Insta-kill. We're going for Death by Recoil. Wait, she dodged it? Okay, well, I guess we'll go for Growl then. Poppy calls for Iron Defense, which actually allows us to do it too. Who would've thought? The second Brave Bird connects, but following the attack drop, it's not enough to knock out Xyla. So, another Growl. I don't feel like I'd call what crickets do growling, but I do like the idea of Poppy having her giant metal raven fly full force at us, followed by crickets as it fails to kill. Just makes everything feel a bit awkward. I mean, surviving the third brave bird for more crickets is really just insulting. If I were Poppy, I'd be forfeiting at this point. A fourth brave bird finally brings a close to Xyla's growling, but Corviknight's so embarrassed that it may as well be dead. We call on Granita next, who's half destroyed by the Stealth Rock before being crushed by Body Press. Again, to add to the embarrassment, Snom does live on 1 HP. That allows us to connect with Icy Wind to deal some good damage and drop Corviknight's speed. Once Snom's beaten, we call on Ralts, who has our only available super effective move. The speed drop from Icy Wind allows Bullcut to attack first, landing a Thunderbolt to finish off Corviknight. Incredible teamwork. Right, that's still only two of our Pokémon down. Poppy sends out Magnazone next, and its Flash Cannon almost knocks out Ralts, but this team really loves me. They do not want me to feel sad. We only get a bit of damage off with Psychic, but it's better than nothing. Poppy calls for Light Screen next, which we are absolutely fine with, because even that isn't going to stop Earth Power. Okay, on to Bronzong. We switch out to Scatterbug when the bell chimes in, and as this is the most sensible place to do it, we let her terrestrialize. Alfombra's Bug-type Terror Blast ends up being a crit because she wants some praise, which I will give now. You are truly incredible, Alfombra. Thank you for the one-hit KO. When Tinkaton enters the battle last, we call for Stun Spore as Gigaton Hammer smashes into Scatterbug. If you thought she wouldn't live on 1 HP though, you've clearly not been paying attention. 
Alfombra survival in that moment has all but guaranteed our win. Terra Blast from Scatterbug, double earth power from Sunkern, and that's all she wrote. It probably won't come as a shock to you to learn that we didn't beat Poppy at the first time of asking. We really needed the power of friendship to get us through that one. Well, that's probably as bad as it gets, so that's something. I mean, Larry's using a team of flying types, so that's not ideal, but still preferable to steal. No Corviknight either, which is nice. We spent a lot of time on Poppy, so let's make this a bit quicker. Snom, Tropius, Quickclaw, Icy Wind, one shot. Snom, Altaria, Quickclaw, Icy Wind, one shot. This is going well. Snom, Star Raptor, no Quickclaw, Brave Bird, one shot. Cricketot, Star Raptor, Brave Bird, one shot. Scatterbug, Star Raptor, Brave Bird, one shot, recoil, double KO. Sunkern, Oricorio, Air Slash, Focus Sash, Endeavor, Air Slash, Power of Love, Giga Drain, KO. That takes us down to Flamigo. Larry terrestrializes his ace, whose Brave Bird is just enough to wipe out Leaf's 2 HP. It isn't quite enough to take out Bowl Cut, though. Once again, the Power of Love comes through for us, and Thunderbolt's able to finish off Flamigo to hand us the win. There's only one Elite Four member left now. At this point, we run into a slightly unfortunate snag. I sold almost all of my items to fund the team's Vitamin Dependency before coming to the Pokemon League. That included every TM that we couldn't use, all of the 999 Hapini dust that we'd collected, and the healing items that I deemed unnecessary. Unfortunately, I sold all but 10 revives for some reason. Now, I'm not sure if you've been keeping track, but we're up to 11 deaths in the Elite Four, so... Cricketot's gonna have to sit this one out. The battle gets underway with Grenita facing off against Hassel's Noivern. Snom starts by dodging an Air Slash, then countering with Icy Wind for the knockout. The excitement of our perfect start is somewhat dulled by a Haxorus Rock Tomb that causes Granita to faint, but we're still doing well. We get a classic appearance from Alfombra next, whose sole purpose is Paralysis. Once that goal is achieved, Bullcut enters to finish Haxorus with Dazzling Gleam. Ralts just goes on a tear from there. Psychic one-shots Hassel's Dragalgy before a return to Dazzling Gleam does in Flapple. Hassel's ace back Scalibur finally brings that run to an end with Icicle Crash, but it's too little too late. Well, kinda. Leaf the Sunkern comes out next to execute the Focus Sash Endeavor strategy, but Icicle Crash forces a flinch, so that fails. Ultimately, it comes down to Space Hopper. We take advantage of Terrestrialization on our side too, with Azuril eating an Icicle Crash before hitting back with Terra Blast for the win. This battle was a mess. Between Noivern's terrifying speed and Icicle Crash's affinity for a flinch, this took upwards of 20 tries. In theory, Icicle Crash should only be causing a flinch 27% of the time, and yet Hassel's back Scalibur was reeling off 3 and 4 in a row at points. I know I'm getting through most of these battles because my Pokemon love me so much, so Pot Kettle Black and all that, but still. Thankfully, and I really wasn't sure it would, the game heals up your team before you face the champion. Otherwise, we would have been in a bit of trouble. Zero revives and one conscious Pokemon doesn't make for the best combo. Everyone's available though, so we get things started as is becoming tradition with Granita. I feel like I was not expecting much from Snom after the run in Sword, but Granita has killed it, especially in the Elite Four. No changes here. After Gita calls for her Espathra to set up Reflect, Granita scores the one shot with Bug Buzz. King Gambit's up next, and the new Bisharp evolution gets right to work, crushing Granita with Stone Edge. Alfombra gets a little bit luckier, dodging King Gambit's attack and connecting with Stun Spore. We take that opportunity to keep Scatterbug alive and switch into Xyla to run out the Reflect. Once Xyla's down, we send in Space Hopper, activate her terrestrial form, and start blasting. King Gambit goes down in one. Ava Luck lives long enough to send an Avalanche crashing down on Azuril, but Terra Blast cuts her down too. Gogoat starts with Bulk Cup, which is maybe just enough to help it survive the first Terra Blast, but when Azuril's living Horn Leech on 1 HP, you know it's not your day. Terra Blast, KO. Veluza's Aqua Jet should really be enough to deflate Space Hopper. She's only got one hit point, but you don't know how much she hates seeing me sad. Terra Blast, KO. Gita somehow manages to keep her cool and sends out her ace Glamora, whose Sludge Wave does manage to chip away that single hit point. We send Alfombra back into the match as Glamora's own Terra Blast fires across the battlefield. This time, our survival on 1 HP is courtesy of a Focus Band and not just complete luck. Although, that is also luck-based. Stun Spore paralyzes Glamora, and from there, it's all over. When Leaf the Sunkern enters the battle, it only takes a single super effective energy ball, and Glamora and Gita are no more. The six worst Pokemon in the game have beaten the Elite Four and Champion. You know what they say, though. 
It ain't over till the Ed Sheeran sings. It's true of the second Hobbit movie. It's true of Game of Thrones, maybe? And it's certainly true of this Pokemon game. So, before we can roll credits with Ed Sheeran, we've got one last face-off with Nimona. Leaf starts things off against Lycanroc and is clattered by Stone Edge, but takes it well before one-shotting the Rock-type with Giga Drain. When Gudra enters the battle, we switch out to Granita, who is only able to land one Icy Wind before fainting. Xyla the Cricketot comes next, chomping down twice with Bug Bite for a rare knockout. Xyla's been something of an unsung hero in this run, mostly just there to facilitate free switches, but she's been a key part of the team. The comedy crickets against Pormot further prove her worth. When Bulka comes out, she traces Volt Absorb, which helps a lot against a Pormot, and then blows away the big teddy bear with Psychic. For Earthworm, we switch back to Leaf the Sunkern, but it's no use. We don't get a chance to use Earth Power with Iron Tail knocking him out. Then it's time for another classic as we run back the Stun Spore Pounce combo for the millionth time. Every member of this team has served a very specific purpose, and they've all done their jobs perfectly. By the time Scatterbug goes down, there's no way Earthworm is outspeeding anything, so one route's Thunderbolt ties up the match. Both sides have two Pokemon remaining. Against the Dunsparce, I really confused myself. I set up Trick Room specifically for the final phase of the battle, but then forgot about that and terrestrialized even though I knew we were slower. It's all a big mess. Anyway, we're in a 1 on 2 now. It is worth noting that at this point, Space Hopper is level 99. Trick Room enables Azuril to strike first, and when Nimona wastes a turn using Coil, Body Slam levels the match. Meowskarada is the last Pokemon to face off against Azura, with Nimona instantly terrestrializing her ace. Trick Room is still active though, and Azura's base speed is 20, so the level 99 part doesn't really matter. Body Slam connects, crushing Meowskarada into a puddle of chlorofeline goo, handing us the ultimate win over our... Frival? Is there a frenemy-style word for a rival? It doesn't matter, we won. Almost there. Do you remember like 20-25 minutes ago when we took down the final Titan Pokemon, Tatsugiri? Well, Arvin told us to meet him at the lighthouse near Cabo Poco, and despite traveling the world, beating several gyms, taking down Team Star, defeating the Elite Four and Champion since then, somehow we beat him here. Our Pokemon have gained almost 300 levels collectively since then. What has he been doing? Regardless, once inside, his father, Professor Turo, instructs us to go down into the Great Crater of Paldea, which I don't think I've mentioned even once. If you came to this video to figure out the plot of this game, I have done a truly terrible job. The plot's actually pretty fantastic as far as Pokemon games go though, so you should play it. Arvin insists on battling us so he can know we're ready, and if you remember when I just told you everything we've been through since this battle became available, you can probably figure out how this one goes. It's not the easiest battle we've had by any means, but I wasn't exactly worried about the result at any point. Alfombra even gets to deal the winning blow, which is a fun change. There's still a battle in this game that we've got to do. I'm gonna skip through all of Area Zero to get to it. There's no way I'm even trying this without getting the whole team to level 100 though. We're pretty close at this point and have saved up our rare candy, so it shouldn't take too long. Once we mash B through an attempted evolution for approximately the 400th time, we're all ready to go. There are a few quick little battles along the way, but the entire Area Zero section builds to a face-off with AI Turo. That's all that's important in the context of this run, so let's do it. The battle gets underway with Iron Moth, a futuristic version of Volcarona taking on Leaf the Sunker. That may seem less than wise, but I trust Leaf. A quick claw pop allows Earth Power to land first, getting us off to the perfect start. Iron Jugulus, Jugulus, Hugulus, Jugulus, Jugulus. The future version of Hydreigon's up next, so we switch into Xyla, who just sort of dies? That happens though. Alfombra's up next and manages to survive Air Slash before transitioning into a bit of stun pouncing. Once Future High Dragon slowed down, Bullcut comes in to blow it away with Dazzling Gleam. That's two down on both sides. Iron Hands is next for AI Turo, and while Future Hariyama lands a strike with Fake Out, Psychic causes another one shot. Iron Thorns is fourth in line, and this sort of requires another sacrifice. Granita goes down to allow a free switch into Sunkern. Leaf dodges a Stone Edge by wobbling to one side and then hits back with Earth Power for yet another one-hit KO. AI Turo's penultimate Pokemon is Iron Bundle, which personally gave me nightmares in the run I did on my second channel. This time around though, no such problems. Leaf survives a Freeze Dry and then hits back with Giga Drain for his third knockout of the match. 
That's supposed to be the worst Pokemon in existence. I won't hear it. Legendary performance. Iron Valiant is up last, and with three Pokemon still standing, we're in complete control. The future Mega Gavlardivoire is no match for Leaf either. Another Quick Claw Pop allows Giga Drain to take it down to low health while replenishing Sunkern. Poison Jab does knock out Sunkern right after, but that was still unbelievable. Bowl Cut returns to battle next to face off against the distant future version of a combination of the two Mega Evolved versions of her final stage. Is. Stage is. Sometimes simpler is better though, you know? Poison Jab isn't enough to knock out Ralts, and with all of the work that Leaf put in, Psychic is more than enough to finish things. AI Turo is defeated, and we didn't even need Space Hopper. There's one more battle where we're forced to use only Maridon, but that's irrelevant to us. The only thing standing between us and Ed Sheeran is cutscenes. So yeah, you can beat Pokemon Violet using the 6 worst Pokemon in the game. If this proves anything though, it's that just about any Pokemon can be good in the right context and the right team. I really love this game, as unfinished and broken as it may be, I've had a lot of fun playing it so far. This run certainly took a while, but it was a really good challenge, which is what you want from these kinds of runs. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. I promise it won't be another year.